Ong Jo, thank you for joining us today. Uh, you know, it's not too long ago we were here to talk about IoT and how we can be able to uh, participate in the journey that are happening in front of us. In, in fact, I think that I'll start with the concept of really innovation that are really driving the changes that are going to impact all of our lives. And today, what I'm going to discuss would be a little bit about Samsung and Samsung innovation, the area of our interest in the, uh, investment, as well as the where we see the data going and how the data can be able to, like the way it looks at it, can impact our lives better going forward. So, um, France is an innovation nation. It's a country that uh, actually, other than Silicon Valley, has one of the largest talent for the AI, for the um, area of VR and AR, and core competency in some of the core microprocessor technologies that are, have happened in many parts of France over the years. And now I understand there are almost 10,000 startups. And the, uh, for several years, I've been coming to France. And uh, we've been talking with the idea of startups, how important that is, and how the startups can be able to feed future jobs and future opportunities. So I'm very happy to be part of this community and share where we are going and how we can work with the French startup communities. And obviously, startup isn't the only important idea. The important thing is you really scale up. That is, you start, and then you have to scale, because the only way you can create a large number of jobs are when the company scale. So I'm going to be discussing really about startups as well as scale-up opportunities. So let me just start with Samsung in Europe, so that you have uh, some perspective of where company had been. So we've been here for a long time. We have almost 16,000 employees in Europe. And the, uh, our business is also very large, almost $32 billion worth of uh, sales in Europe. Out of that, over 10% is in France. So we are one of the largest company uh, that are doing the uh, business here. And we're also very happy with the design teams that we work with in creating innovative ideas, UI, UX, as well as product designs. So um, we've been a beneficiary of having a large presence in Europe and has been growing. So the area of our strategic interest that we work with startups is uh, multiple areas, but I would say it's about driven around data, starting with smart machines. And what are the smart machines? Smart machine could be robotics, it could be drones, it could be autonomous driving vehicles, or it could be anything that can make our living better by having the AI, connectivity, and with the data insight. Health is another area we're very interested in. We see the whole area of health will continue to evolve and change based on the new data. Obviously, the health area is a big area that all the government is worried about, as the uh, amount of GMP that have to spend in taking care of our aging population, population that are also um, growing older, and this demographic change, along with the, um, the population that are increasing around the world, inc so increasingly, almost 20% of US GMP is spent in taking care of healthcare. And this trend is continuing for all countries around the world. So unless we create a technology that can help us to live better, this burden will continue. So the idea of preventive health, using IoT, using data, using the uh, genome information, biome information, that can give us a better insight around the uh, prediction and diagnostic around health will be very critical area of, ex uh, uh, area of opportunity as well. Um, obviously, the Internet of Things are being discussed a lot. I look at everything in vertical market as IoT, whether it's the uh, automotive, whether it's a health, whether it's an enterprise, whether it's an industrial, they all can get benefit of that. 
of course, at home as well. But in the beginning, a lot of obvious opportunity is in the area of industrial. But over time, we see the, uh, the benefit go into all areas of our living. And then, of course, without data infrastructure, we cannot be able to accommodate all these requirements. So Samsung is, in a way, data company that you never heard of. We, don't, we are not like Facebook. We are not like Google. We don't sell data. We don't market data. But half of the data in the world will go through Samsung products, whether it's a Samsung memories, whether Samsung SSDs, whether it is a server systems. So in many ways, we are the beneficiary of this proliferation of data that are going on. So let me talk a little bit about data. So this is a chart. I'm sure you've seen it before. It looks like a uh, Alibaba number, exponential, growing. And the, uh, it's been a good for a lot of people that has been involved in data business. And the, uh, you can see that where we are today, uh, there's almost 20 zettabytes. And migrating 10x by 2025. And what's interesting about this data is only 3% attacked and 0.5% is analyzed. Means there's a lot of data that are out there that could be utilized for better understanding around our living, our health, our whereabouts. So there are a whole bunch of things that I'm sure we can talk more about this. But the, the fact is very clear. Data is growing. It's a great business. And we're very happy to be part of that. And the, if you translate 160 gigabytes, I'm trying to visualize with the Samsung products or some things we can relate to. It turned out it's a 2.5 billion hours of 4K ultra high definition movies. Or if you look at number of galaxies, if you stack them up, it's a 12 trillion galaxy SAs, assuming it's 128 gigabytes of memory, each of them. So that's a lot. Actually, 12 trillion doesn't sound like a lot, but if you, if you stack them up, it'll go all the way to the moon and come back. That's how far, how big that is. So 20th century, much of our economy is driven by oil. Although oil has been around for a long time, right? Oil has been found in China over 2,000 years ago. Oil has been around in the uh, Middle East for a long time. But it was only used for certain areas like you know, lamps and things. But when the automobile became real, that's when oil became true engine of 20th century economy. And the whole concept of economy is really a, from drilling to production to distribution to refining and then all the way to consumption create much of business that we didn't have it before. This is why oil economy was critical to creating jobs, creating a new way of doing things. So I would say that where we are today in 21st century, we are in a verge of the new oil, which is data. So we are all in it together. And the, if you look at the kind of opportunity that we are looking at is generating data. IoT, much of that is really about generating data from sensors, from different devices, fusing them together. And then data curation, you know, putting those data and how you're making sense out of those data. And then you have to then migrate to some kind of a platform where you're going to combine the data, where it's going to be going into the cloud and then matching it with some other data. Eventually, as it looks at the intelligence, the insight will come out of there. And then eventually, it will present to some useful form Hopefully, they can help us drive better. Hopefully, it can help us to live better by having some kind of diagnostics, that type of all examples that we can discuss. So each of these areas is an opportunity for entrepreneurs. Each of these areas will become very big, like what happened. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as my part of my talk. So let me give you comparison.
the overall global economy perspective. So imagine top 10 most valuable companies 10 years ago. How many of them would have been oil companies? Five. There were five companies that are oil companies that are the most valuable in the world. Today, if you look at 10 years later, only one, only one company is oil. Seven out of 10 are platform companies. Companies that are making sense out of data, companies that are being able to use data to create new opportunities. Well, some of them are also uh, may not be so constructive, productive, but anyhow, it's a data companies that are taking advantage of a lot of things that we do. So you can see the already economy is, the, the, the shareholders are voting the new economy. And you can also see that transition point happened around 2013, where oil economy stayed flat last 10 years at the trillion dollar market cap, and data economy came and then went over now it's three times bigger than oil economy when you look at the top five companies. So you see, this is one indicator, just my benchmark, it could be other way of looking at it, but it shows that there are change going on right in front of us. We're living in the middle of it. And I wanna talk a little bit about the changes that we see that could impact all of our lives. First thing is all about where are data coming? Where does it come from? So some examples of autonomous vehicle. When it comes fully autonomous, and when it comes from lidars, radars, videos, sensors around it, fusing them together can create as much as four terabytes of data. It's a lot of data. Not all of the data will go to the cloud. Some will stay local. Some will go to the cloud, and it's the deviation of architecture that's going to make and break some of these intelligent edge discussions that are going on. Industrial is a clear example. Obviously, industrial was more of the area that people figured out earlier. Airplane is a great example of industrial IoT. Many sensors that are watching all the data and being able to maintain proactively and being able to prevent any disasters could happen. Healthcare, I mentioned how important that is going forward. So all in all, I think that people are expecting the economy could be as much as $9.4 trillion by 2025. I'm not a good predictor, predict, forecaster on this, but I believe actual number will be bigger than this. As things tend to accelerate, and as forecasters tend to either overcast Forecast or under forecast, they're never right. So let me just say why I think that I'm very optimistic about where the uh, future is going. The, 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 uh, only 10 years ago, smartphone came out, right? Right now, all of us think smartphone has been with us for a long time. Actually, if you think about 10 years ago, it was a product called Blackberry. Raise a hand if you used Blackberries in the past. Many of you. Do you remember Blackberry? Blackberry used to be called Crackberry because people cannot get away from Blackberry, right? It was a great product. I loved my Blackberry also. But nobody talks about that because now we have a supercomputer in our pocket. But the supercomputer is more than a phone, more than a computer. It has many sensors built in. In fact, the Samsung Galaxy 8 has 11 sensors built in in the phone that are helping you to know proximity sensors that can kind of help you with the distance from your face to your products. It has a light sensors that knows how to adjust the lights. It has a GPS built in so it knows exactly where you are. And so there are many, many, and cameras, obviously, that can give you really good pictures. Now we can even do a voice command, so you can be able to navigate and command what you want to do without uh, talking actual pictures like this. So with the NFC and other type of things, can be able to give you whole new applications that we could not think of. Uber or Airbnb would not be possible without having precise location, text messaging, 
and being able to check on your credit system through the, um, your register information. So all those things are all happening because it's in your pocket. So it's time for applying all the technology into one, and they can give us whole new applications that we haven't thought about. So, um, you know, this whole area of Uber, so Lyft, and other things has been exciting. But I think that even more exciting to me is that this technology can really, truly impact our lives. Most of our driving experience is that of people-driven problems, right? 93% of all the accidents are driven by human accidents, contribution, not the machine. And I talked about the importance of health that are becoming very critical. And I'll give you some examples of how we can be able to change. So to me, these are intelligent, connected world. They can make our lives much better. And technology can not only have people to use Facebook, but actually it can be very useful for help us to have a better record, better information, and help us to live better. And therefore, we all have a better lives. So let me give you an example of biology. So with the data, having a drop of blood, one can have a lot of information about your genome, your biome, as well as the uh, information about your habits. Along with that, you can be able to change survival rate from late stage to early stage dramatically by as much as 90%. So this change is really important, and the only thing that we have to do is making sure we are looking at this thing proactively. And being able to bring the price of compute, bring the price of the analysis, which I think is all doable with a better compute, better sensor technology, I think that we can be able to create a, a better living world. And it takes only eight jettabytes of data. It is a lot of data, but it's very doable. The other example is autonomous driving, right? So um, I don't know when autonomous driving will really happen. It may take time, but we know that, um, I mean, I drive uh, Tesla, and I would say that it's not fully autonomous, no way. However, when I'm driving highway, I know my wife tells me that it, drive better, it drives better than me. So why is that? It turned out, it tends to stay right in the middle of the road. It keeps the you know, six car lengths that I set, preset, and just monitors that. It does really do a few things right, and frankly, when I'm driving, probably I'm more erratic than that. So the point, I think, is that this is a very small step, but these are small steps, when you put it all together, it's going to get better. And I would never say it's autonomous driving yet, because it's not totally safe. It doesn't recognize the cones down under your uh, radars or cameras. They so could just uh, miss that. Or if your pavement lane is not obvious, it can get into trouble. So I'm, I'm giving you full disclosure that it's not fully autonomous yet, unlike someone else who claims it is. However, you can see the progress that are going on. And you can see it's going to generate a lot of data. And to do it, you need to have local data as well as cloud data. So we are still in that journey. The good news for a tech person like me is a lot of things we're investing, whether it's a 4G and 5G, because you need to have a very short latency with a lot of data that can be able to come to your devices. And also, you need a lot of storage in your car because of 50 terabytes of data that are being amassed in the car it's much bigger than what we are used to in the car. Car of tomorrow will be a small data center in your trunk. It will have a multiple computers. Already, typical car has 200 sensors. But imagine all the sensors are now getting smart, connected. It requires much faster processing. It requires some kind of AI chip that can be able to process it in a much lower power than the GPU that you're used to today, right? Much of training is going on with the GPU, which takes about one teraflops per watt. And typical car will need probably 20 to 60 type of teraflops to compute. 
which means you need a lot of power. And the uh, power is not good. And the, uh, we need to figure out, like our human brains, right? If you think about human brains, we have 100 billion neurons in our head that are processing concurrently in parallel with a 20 watt of power. That's what we need, really, in the car as well. So I think what you see from biology, we can learn a lot from where we need to go. And I think you will see much of technology that we are discussing, CPUs to GPUs to you know, MPUs, are going to become a lot like what we have in our brain. And when they become smarter and better and lower power, maybe someday we could be hitting singularity, but I'm not predicting that yet. It's going to be a while. So in the state economy, there will be a whole bunch of challenges, and I don't want to underestimate those challenges. And I think that these uh, challenges, uh, some of them are technical challenges, right? How do you make sure the, the uh, security uh, which I think next speaker is going to talk about, as well, as well as the privacy issues about your data, um, as well as the um, how do you know who really you are when you're in online. So identity management is going to be really critical. But I believe those are the kind of things we are going to get better at it, improve technically. Maybe the bigger issue is about our mindset. A mindset is about approach an approach around how do you use different technologies to mix and support, or man, is it man versus machine, or is it man and machine? Somehow we have to figure out how to navigate conditions that we've never been to before. Is man going to make decision about where we're going to go when we have a choice between option A of hitting bicyclist? or running into the car, or running into people? Or is it the machine going to make decision for you? It's not very clear to me, but we are going whole new places that we haven't been to. These are some of the big challenges. And then, obviously, data policies, right? How much of your data is your data? How much does it belong to platform companies? Or how much, what's the right boundary? And what are the geographic boundary? These are the challenges that I believe the regulators are trying to be in front, but typically technology and innovation goes much faster than the regulars can catch up. So we're in a very interesting race where you see in US Senate today, they are grilling both Googles and Facebooks and others around the, um, what happened the last year's election. That's because we're trying to catch up, because we didn't see it coming, we didn't have the right regulation, we didn't know what would be the right policy in dealing with these companies. Lastly, we are all here because nobody can do it alone. I mentioned about the autonomous driving, digital health. It still requires huge innovation. It requires huge partnership and being able to use data to make sense out of it. So this journey is going to become very long and requires a partnership and requires openness in collaborating. So, and I believe the market for data economy it's not local. It has to be global in mind because of the opportunities of combining the data, which in turn makes it bigger opportunities. So I think that uh, we are all in a great place to be today that are driving huge opportunities for not only for tech companies, but for government, for education, for industrial. All these vertical space can change and revolutionize. And this is why I call it new economy, and data-driven economy, and all of us will be part of that. And the, uh, to do that, we have some great speakers today. They can share their perspective in how we are going to navigate. So thank you very much for your time.